Funding for Shape Realist is provided by Squarespace, the sponsor of today's video. I don't really want to talk too much shit about Disney's creative works. I think the rest of the internet has got that covered. But corporate Disney, on the other hand, they can never get too much criticism. If you are a corporate Disney defender, you need to log off and reflect on your life choices. But really though, if anything, this video will be constructive criticism for them. Hey Disney, you guys want to know why you had such an abysmal financial year for your 100th anniversary? Other than the fact that people are just tired of bad movies. Well, let me tell you what I think the main culprit behind Disney's sharp decline at the box office is. It's Disney Plus. No. What once seems like a great new business venture for the company is now a tumor that is hampering their creative works and commercial returns. First, creatively. I talked about this in my video on why the MCU is poodoo now, but to reiterate, Disney Plus shows like Falcon and the Winter Soldier, Miss Marvel, Moon Knight, etc. very much could have and should have been movies. Instead, they were stretched out into six episode TV shows in order to give Disney Plus more content. The same principle applies to Star Wars stuff like the Obi-Wan show and the Book of Boba Fett, which very clearly did not have strong enough plots to be stretched out the way they were. I sincerely believe that all of these products would have been better if they had just been condensed into films, rather than being excuses to keep your streaming service for six weeks rather than just one. But this effect isn't just detrimental to these standalone stories, it's also actively harming the wider MCU as a whole. Audiences simply cannot keep up with multiple six episode TV shows a year on top of the three blockbuster movies you were already asking them to watch. It was fine when it was just the blockbuster movies, that was pretty easy, but like, come on man. 2021 had five TV shows alone, on top of four movies. Granted, a lot of these were supposed to come out in 2020, but spilled over because of the pandemic. But like, it's okay to push things back in order to not oversaturate your brand. I remember how excited everyone was for WandaVision and Loki. It felt like everyone was talking about them. Compare that to Eternals and... Hawkeye, which came out towards the end of the same year. I don't know a single person who watched either of these. Oh, wait, that's not true. My friend watched the last episode of Hawkeye just to see Kingpin, and then they didn't watch the rest. The MCU, everybody! And this problem has only gotten worse in recent years, with Miss Marvel and Secret Invasion having the lowest viewership out of any of the premieres of these shows. And that Miss Marvel low viewership is kind of important, right? Because guess what the most recent MCU movie was? The Marvels, the single biggest financial flop in the entire MCU. You. Now, you can blame this on a variety of factors colliding. General MCU fatigue, the fact that the cast couldn't promote it during the actor's strike, or the fact that it stars women and audiences hate women. Oh no! H hey, just just, just don't, don't, don't look up how much money the first Captain Marvel made. It, it definitely did not make over a billion dollars. Hey, also don't look up how much money Barbie made this year. It also did not make over a billion dollars. No. No, audiences just hate movies starring women, that's it. But going back to reality, I think one of the main issues with its performance is what it's asking of the audience. If it was just billed as a straight-up sequel to billion-dollar hit Captain Marvel, then it might have performed better. But looking at this poster, it's pretty evident to a lot of people that you need to watch Miss Marvel to understand what's going on fully. Miss Marvel, the show with the lowest ratings out of any MCU Disney Plus premiere. That's not even mentioning Monica Rambo, who was a side character from WandaVision. I mean, technically she was in the first Captain Marvel as well, but to understand why she's a superhero, you gotta watch WandaVision. And sure, most people did, so it's not a huge deal. It really is the large presence of Miss Marvel that most likely serves as a detriment to this movie's success. I mean, think about it. Even if you watched Miss Marvel, which again, not a lot of people did, you've been psychologically conditioned to think of her as a TV character. Character, one that you can see the adventures of on Disney Plus. So why would you go to a movie theater to watch more of her adventures? This feels like a TV movie because she's in it. So why would you not just wait until you can watch it on your TV? I really hate to say all this stuff because Miss Marvel is one of the most charming characters to come out of the MCU post Endgame. And Iman Vellani is clearly a star in the making. I hope she has an amazing career after this. But like, from a general audience's perspective, this movie does not look like a theatrical event. Most people who are even mildly interested probably said, eh, 
just wait for it to be on Disney Plus. And that's the heart of the issue here. Waiting for Disney Plus. I think Disney's instant recognizability within the film industry is kind of backfiring on them with this instance. Alright, here's a thought experiment. Let's say you were interested in watching Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse in theaters. You can't exactly look at it and say, oh, I'll wait until it comes to streaming. Because what streaming service would that be? Yeah, Disney owns Marvel, but it's pretty clear to most audiences that the Spider-Man brand is tied to Sony. And most new Spider-Man movies don't show up on Disney Plus until years after the fact. So, which streaming service is Spider-Verse showing up on? I don't know. Maybe I should check it out in theaters while I can. Then there's Barbie, which is a Warner Bros. property. And it's not immediately obvious to the average consumer that HBO Max, oh, excuse me, Max, is where you go for Warner Bros. content. Good reason to see it in theaters, huh? Meanwhile, look at the Little Mermaid remake. That's probably as well known of a brand as Barbie and Spider-Man. But it made less than them, and less than a lot of the other Disney live-action remakes. And I think a good reason for that is because it's a Disney property. You can just watch it eventually on Disney+. Plus, The same place you can watch other Disney live-action remakes that went straight there, like Pinocchio or Lady and the Tramp. And this sentiment absolutely applies to Pixar movies as well. Disney chose to release Soul, Luca, and Turning Red straight onto Disney+. Plus. With Soul, it made sense because of the pandemic, and Luca kinda did, I guess. But by the time 2022 rolled around, theaters were very much back open. And yet, Turning Red remains a Disney Plus exclusive. Oh, but Lightyear, that's gonna be our big return to theaters, Oh, There's quite a few reasons why Lightyear bombed, including but not limited to brain-dead conservatives losing their minds over two seconds of ladies kissing, the fact that this is a movie concept no one ever asked for in history and it looked really boring from the trailers, and finally, the fact that at this point, you conditioned audiences to watch new Pixar movies on Disney+. And then there's Elemental, which weirdly had a lot more pre-release controversy than Lightyear, despite being, I don't know, not as stupid of an idea. It didn't even have a gay kiss, so there was nothing for brain-dead conservatives to get mad at. And yet, this movie also didn't really do that great. And look, there's been a ton of discussion about Elemental's big box office comeback, and I really think a lot of that is quite overblown. Yes, Elemental did a lot better than its abysmal opening weekend would have you expect. And you know what? That's nice. Good for it. Contrary to popular belief, I'm glad this movie wasn't a total flop, because it is kind of sweet and well-intentioned, even if I didn't like it. But like, its final worldwide gross ended up being a little under $500 million. Not only did Mario and Spider-Verse beat it at the box office, but other original Pixar movies released during the 2010s did. Coco, Inside Out, even Brave made more money than it. And I think a key incentive for people to not take their families to see this movie in theaters is the knowledge that in a couple months, it'll just be on Disney Plus anyway. The same place we watch Soul, Luca, and Turning Red. This is what I mean when I say Disney Plus is detrimental in the long term to Disney's brand. It's the one company where anyone can immediately tell you what streaming service their movies are going to end up on in a few months. And the weird thing is, Disney seems to be relishing in that? Take the new Haunted Mansion reboot that came out this year. For some reason, Disney chose to release this spooky looking movie in July? We all kind of collectively scratched our heads at that. Until October rolled around and Disney started advertising that the movie was coming to Disney Plus. I... Uh, what? What are you doing? If you just wanted this to be a Disney Plus exclusive, then why did you bother with that theatrical release at all? It didn't work! It feels like this company is eating itself alive for short-term profit, all the while ignoring the fact that it's gonna be really hard for them to regain the box office stranglehold they held a mere four years ago. 2019 saw the releases of seven billion dollar hits for Disney. SEVEN! Avengers Endgame, The Lion King, Frozen 2, Captain Marvel, The Rise of Skywalker, Toy Story 4, and Aladdin. Plus, Far From Home if you want to count co-productions with Sony. It was their biggest box office year ever. But it also marked the end of the MCU as we knew it. The end of the Skywalker saga. And the last few live-action remakes of the extremely popular Disney Renaissance films. Well, okay, I guess Little Mermaid is also on Aladdin and Lion King's level 
level of popularity, but we saw how that turned out. Regardless, 2019 was pretty clearly as big as the bubble was gonna get before it burst. And coincidentally, it was also the same year when Disney Plus launched. Now, this service proved to be helpful during the pandemic since it was an easy method of delivering new movies straight to people's homes. But the box office has clearly been suffering as a result. In 2021, the only huge hit they had was another co-production with Sony, Spider-Man No Way Home. Again, a movie where it isn't clear what streaming service it's gonna end up on. But whatever, movie theaters weren't fully back yet throughout the majority of the year. We'll give them a pass. In 2022, we started to see the return of the marquee Marvel characters that finally got audiences back. Doctor Strange, Thor, Black Panther, these were all solid money makers, and while none of them broke a billion dollars, their numbers are nothing to sneeze at. The only billion dollar hit Disney had this year was Avatar The Way of Water, which, like, I'm pretty sure 90% of audiences don't even know that's a Disney thing now. But still, good for them, they got a hit. And now we reach 2023, where their only massive hit has been Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3, and everything else has kinda flopped compared to what people were expecting. So, I think you've noticed a trend with their biggest hits throughout the past three years. With the exception of Avatar, which is more of a once in a blue moon franchise than anything, the only things that have consistently made Disney money at the box office have been Marvel movies. Everything else has fallen off the face of the earth. And you wanna know why? Because audiences are conditioned to watch movies on Disney Plus. Disney and Pixar animated films, they'll be on Disney Plus. Live action remakes, they'll be on Disney Plus. And some of the lesser Marvel characters like Ant-Man or the Marvels, they'll be on Disney Plus. Quantumania had the lowest gross of the entire Ant-Man trilogy. And the Marvels, yeah, obviously that has the lowest gross of the Captain Marvel duology. Guardians 3 is the movie people legitimately want wanted to see based on the goodwill built up by the first two movies. It broke through the MCU fatigue everyone's been feeling because the Guardians movies are a unified trilogy first and an MCU property second. This looks like a movie worth seeing in theaters. Ant-Man looked like generic streaming slop. Why bother? So with 2023 almost behind us, what does the future hold for Disney financially? I'm genuinely curious because right now it doesn't look too hot. The company's only huge success of the year came from the guy who is now gonna run the rival superhero studio. Marvel is rapidly losing people's interest, and it's abundantly clear that the Kang storyline they were building up is going down in flames, for a number of reasons. Meanwhile, the animated features and live action remakes aren't doing enough to attract audiences to theaters. All that really leaves is Star Wars, which might be the biggest dumpster fire out of all these brands right now? The most popular film franchise in the world cannot get a damn movie off the ground. With projects getting canceled left and right, all as the brand continues to only receive new content through increasingly mediocre streaming shows. The more time passes, the more it becomes abundantly clear that they only greenlit something as good as Andor by accident. Anyway, I think it's way too soon to talk about the future of Star Wars movies at the box office, since most of them seem to be dying in the womb. But I do want to briefly discuss one. Dave Filoni's Mandoverse movie. The big events that The Mandalorian, Ahsoka, and Book of Boba Fett, maybe, I don't even know, are all leading towards an epic crossover movie where the leads of these shows have to team up to defeat Thrawn. All I have to say is, if they actually intend on releasing this in theaters, are they brainless? I feel like this is just a repeat of the problem with the Marvels, asking people to tune in to numerous streaming shows in order to understand a theatrical film is not gonna go well. And even if they release a Star Wars movie that doesn't tie into a bunch of TV shows, how do we know people won't just wait until it comes to streaming and completely ignore it while it's in theaters? Obviously Star Wars is different from the MCU because it's been so long since we got a theatrical movie Movie, so maybe the oversaturation problem won't be as big of an issue. But then again, a lot of people have been talking about how sick of Star Wars they are, myself included, and it's all thanks to its oversaturation on this one streaming service.
Hi, I'm Puff. I'm the editor of this here video, and I'm breaking in to tell you, Disneyers, about how the short-sighted oversaturation of IP isn't just affecting Disney's studio output, but their parks as well. Now, I'm limited on time before the boss man catches on to what I'm doing and locks me back in the basement, so I'm just going to make this as brief as possible by using Epcot as a quick case study. Can we all agree on that? Good. Let's make out. But before that, let's give a quick refresher on what Epcot is supposed to be. Epcot, for those not in the know, stands for Experimental Prototype Community of Tomorrow. What was originally Walt Disney trying to make the city of Rapture IRL eventually was turned into what was supposed to be a permanent world spare by Imagineers after his passing. There are two sections of Epcot, Future World and the World Showcase. Future World is a section of the park dedicated to, well, the future. The rides there were dedicated to showcasing all the possibilities that the future could hold. Then, there's the World Showcase, which was intended to, well, showcase as authentically as possible the cultures of the countries that each pavilion represents. It was a park designed not only to entertain, but to educate and leave park goers optimistic about what the future could hold. Notice I said was. That is because Epcot has lost the f***ing plot. Like, look at this map of Epcot from 2003. There were only two IP-based attractions, both of which were essentially just short films for people to chill out to that were easily replaceable to adjust for modern tastes. Now look at this map of Epcot from 2023. Seven IP-based attractions were added. Every single ride addition since Soren has basically had nothing to do with the f***ing theme. They replaced rides that were focused and rooted in the edutainment design philosophy of the park to make it more Disney completely forgetting what the point of Epcot was supposed to be. And they're doing this to other parks as well. Hollywood Studios used to be a park themed around the magic of movie making. It's an IP dumping ground now. California Adventure was themed around, well, the state of California. A little silly, but now it's an IP dumping ground too, so I guess that doesn't matter anymore. Animal Kingdom is about to be as well, with company leadership announcing that Dinoland USA will be torn down to make way for Indiana Jones and Encanto? I think that can speak for itself, honestly. I could go more into the ways the parks have been declining, but this tangent has gone on long enough, so I highly recommend checking out Poseidon Entertainment's video, Disney's Leadership is Damaging the Brand, if you want to know more about what's been going on on the park side of things. It'd be the perfect double feature to make you want to shoot Bob Iger into the f***ing <laughs> sun. Anyways, I'm going to go back to the basement now, and pray to God the crab didn't notice what I did to his video. Bye! So, the TLDR is that I personally think the very concept of Disney Plus undervalues every brand that falls under the Disney umbrella, making them feel less like theatrical events and more like future content for a streaming service. And I think Disney is the only company that really has this issue, since, ironically, they have the most recognizable brand in the film industry. Everyone knows that Disney content will be on Disney+, Plus, thereby removing the urgency to catch something in theaters. I think the only real solution Disney has to this issue is to just make something bold and risky, because playing it safe clearly isn't working for them. Spider-Verse was a bold risk that shook up every big animation studio except Disney. People feel like they're falling behind the times. They clearly need their own Spider-Verse-like film, something that demands to be seen in a movie theater rather than just existing as a button to click on a streaming service. And honestly, I'm sure they can do it. The Little Mermaid, the original, not the shitty Scuttlebutt remake, was a bold risk that reinvigorated the studio after it really struggled during the 70s and 80s. Disney animation goes through peaks and valleys all the time, so their current slump is nothing new. What is new is the fact that they bought all these massive brands that are also kind of in their flop era. But I have faith that someone could come in and turn these franchises around. It sure as hell isn't going to be Bob Iger. But maybe if someone like Howard Ashman gets their hands on one of these studios, there's hope for them yet. I'm not holding my breath though. And
Anyway, now that I've discussed all that, I bet you're wondering, how can I make my own streaming service? It sounds like a great financial investment. Well, don't do that. Don't, please, please don't. It's not gonna go well. But you know what is a great financial investment if you're interested in making any sort of website? That would be Squarespace. Squarespace is an amazing online website builder that enables you to create beautiful websites for your business or personal hobby. Create your own online store to sell your products. Whether they be physical, digital, or service products, you better believe Squarespace has the tools you need to start selling online. Hop on in with one of their professional website templates with designs for every category and use case. Then make it your own by customizing the design, updating contents, and adding whichever features you need need. Any Squarespace template can do anything you want, allowing your idea, brand, or business to stand out. And on any device, too. You can even host video content using Squarespace. Organizing your video library, showing off your content on beautiful video pages, and selling access to exclusive videos with member areas. The possibilities are near limitless. Check out squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain.